These last couple of weeks, we've been going through this teaching series titled uh, Salt and Light, and that's because God has given each of us a unique assignment that we should all be keen to, and that is he said that we are the, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And by the Lord Jesus doing that, he was giving you and I particular assignments that we want to follow, uh, assignments that we want to keep, and we want to know how to do it. Now, uh, I just want to make an observation right at the top, and this is on your outline as well, is that it will be hard to be the light of the world if our light is out, okay? Uh, Pretty straightforward there. And so one of the things that uh, when we study the scriptures, we see that light is a metaphor uh, for goodness. Uh, Light could be understood as being in fellowship with God, being on the same page with God. And certainly all of us, uh, whether you have a lot of years experience or a few, or you're just starting out, certainly all of us could attest and share uh, that when we have the peace of God and when we are mindful of the promises of God, no matter what problems or pressures or pains that we are enduring, uh, there is an unmistakable peace that is over us. And so when we talk about light, it's all-encompassing in that God wants us uh, to walk in the light so that obviously we could be blessed, but also that he has called us to be the light of the world so we could share those blessings with others. But all of that is for naught if we're covering the light or if light is not in us at all. And so I want to direct your attention. It's right there in your notes, and we're going to be looking at today the 11th chapter of Luke's gospel. And we're going to start in verse 33. And I want to talk with you today about light in you, light in me, and how that is God's will for us, that we would have this light, this light uh, that comes from God, this light that is Jesus Christ, and how very important that is Um, to our own spiritual life, our mental psyche, uh, our overall walk with God. And so uh, take notice here in verse 33, this is Jesus speaking. And after we read the verse, we'll talk about how this fits into the overall context of this chapter and this message series that we've been doing these past couple of weeks. Jesus says, no one lights a lamp and puts it in the cellar or under the basket. Nobody puts it in the basement in other words, or under a basket to cover it. Instead, they put it on a lampstand, the Lord says, so that those who come in may see its light. You know, think about that for a second. You know, when uh, you come to a house, perhaps there is outdoor lights, and you wouldn't see a basket over those lights. Those are entry lights for a reason. You might have one in your foyer or your hallway, and that's there to illuminate so people could see where they're going. So we understand what Jesus is saying, you know, at first blush, but this also fits into a larger context. What he's actually talking about, he's using light as a metaphor for evidence of the grace and mercies of Almighty God. You might say, how? Well, the previous verses... Jesus was telling uh, those who were there, which were a lot of people, a lot of uh, Jewish people, a lot of religious leaders, the crowds that were following him. He was saying that an evil generation acts as for a sign. He's saying, you don't need a sign. A sign has already been given. Signs have been given. And then he said this. He he quoted um, a reference to a historical figure, the Queen of the South, also known as the Queen of Sheba from 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. He says, the queen of Sheba, she believed, and she had far less information. Remember the queen of Sheba? She went from southwest Arabia all the way to Jerusalem. Took about several weeks, well over a thousand miles. It was a a, a crazy journey, but she did it because she wanted to hear the truth of God from the mouth of Solomon. Then Jesus gave another example. He said, how about the Ninevites, the people of Nineveh? They were idolatrous people, but at the preaching of Jonah, even they believed. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying that people in other generations with far less information, they believed faster and more devoted than you did. The light has come and you're choosing not to believe it. In fact, you're saying that I'm repressing it but indeed, I am the light of the world. I've already told you that. So he's saying that it would be foolish for me to suppress the very light that I've come to share with you. And in other words, you have no excuse 
not to have light in you because the message has been given, the message keeps coming, and there are people who have had far less opportunity than you, like the Queen of Sheba, like the people of Nineveh, and they still believed. See, there are a lot of people that say, I can't believe. I want to tell you, there's not a human on this planet that could say that. It's a matter of the will. I will not believe because Jesus has given us so much information, so much evidence, whether it be historical evidence, whether it's just practical understanding, um, whether it's archaeological discoveries. Uh, there's enough evidence there if you do your due diligence. So what's the point? What is keeping these religious people here in chapter 11 from believing? Well, I'm going to tell you what it is. Some of us are very good at it. It's what we call stubbornness. Do we have any stubborn people here today, okay? Do you know any stubborn people? Okay, you might know a few, okay? So write this first principle down. If you're going to have light in you, if you're going to have the light of God in you, avoid stubbornness to make changes. Can you say that with me? Avoid stubbornness to make changes. See, when God shines his light in your life, you have to be willing to make a change. And the people of Jesus' day, uh, they weren't willing to make the changes that God was showing them. And again, it wasn't for lack of evidence because the evidence was right in front of them. In fact, again, he's referencing other people who, had, who didn't have this privilege of having the Lord in front of them. You and I have the Bible. We come to church every week. We have tremendous opportunity. And when God shines his light on me and shines his light on you, and he's trying to show us something that might need to change, Maybe it's a sin that needs to be confessed. Maybe it's an attitude that's not right. Maybe it's things that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing, but we're justifying it. Guess what? When God shines his light, we have to be quick to make the changes. Because in order for the light to be in us, we have to be willing to make whatever adjustments, whatever transformations that God is putting before us. And so let me ask you a rhetorical question or a question that's just between you and God. What changes has God been putting on your heart? Uh, what conviction have you been feeling? Maybe it's something you're doing. Maybe it's a place you're going. Maybe it's just an attitude you have towards people. Maybe it's how you're treating people. Maybe it's how you're handling a situation. Yeah, you might be doing it your way, but here's the question. Is that God's way? And your reason for not making the changes that God wants you to make when he shines the light on you well, guess what? It's stubbornness because we want to do it our way. Uh, we're not willing to make a change, but we need to be willing to make changes because stubbornness will get us into trouble. Look what Proverbs 28, 14 says right here in your notes. Why don't we say this verse together aloud? Blessed are those who fear to do wrong, but the stubborn are headed for serious trouble. You know, you want to have a healthy fear of God, don't you? That's a good thing. You know, that's what I would call a reverence, that we have a reverence for God, that we want to do things his way. We want to go according to his agenda. And when God shines the light in your life on something that needs to change, we should have a holy fear to say, you know what? I want to do what God is calling me to do. Because the alternative, being stubborn and saying, God, I know best, that will re lead to trouble. Now, I never met anybody that said, yeah, I like trouble. I'm hoping I have some trouble today. You know what? It's, I'm having such a good day. I hope I have some trouble soon. You know, it's been too peaceful of a day. You know, I want to get stressed out. You know, I want, to, I, I want to have a terrible rest of the day. Nobody talks like that. But we're sure sending signals that we want to live that way when we're being stubborn, when God shines the light. See, think of light this way. Light reveals, darkness conceals. See, the light wants to reveal things in my life that need to change, how my standards might need to go higher, how something maybe of morality, something uh, within me needs to change. Now, I know there's a lot of us, you know, we might have certain political positions, we might have certain views on this, certain views on that, and you're entitled to that. That's your own free will. But as you grow in your faith in Christ, what we come to realize is, is that our convictions need to match God's commands. And we don't want to be stubborn. I truly believe the enemy, the devil, he loves to get us to a place of stubbornness, to a place of not wanting to make changes when God shines the light. You know, even when we're going through something, you know, in baseball, when the pitcher throws a pitch close to you, it's called 
high heat. He's throwing inside. He wants to back you off the plate so that you can't take your swing, so you're not aggressive. And he, wa- he wants to intimidate you and I. And I believe that the enemy wants to do that to you and I. He wants to get us to a place where we're, we're, we're too scared to take our swings in life for God. Uh, we're not willing to step to the plate anymore. And again, one of the ways that he will do that will be through stubbornness. But we have to be willing to make changes. We have to be willing to make quick changes. See, oftentimes we think, you know what? I got to go fast, fast, fast in my life for God. That's going to lead to spiritual breakthrough. That's how I'm going to be the light of the world. On the contrary, if you're willing to make changes, when listen, we make wrong decisions. And when God shines the light, we want to get it right. We got to be like a cheetah. Now you might say, well, what does a cheetah have to do with the Bible? Well, God created cheetahs, first of all. Second of all, uh, they provide a great illustration for changing. If you've ever watched a cheetah run down an antelope, you know that they're pretty fast cats. But as it turns out, speed is not the reason for their prodigious hunting skills. Several years ago, uh, New York Times published a research project on cheetahs, and it revealed just how nimble, uh, just how flexible, just how agile they are, and how that results in them being a danger to their prey, and ultimately why the antelope doesn't have a good shot. The study reveals the following. Cheetahs, uh, they run as fast as 58 miles per hour. Now, my very first car at Dodge Dynasty only went up to about 52, by the way, okay? If you hit a bump, the the windows came down. The one good thing, well, two good things about that car. One time I got hit, it was like being in a tank, okay? The new car didn't stand a chance. The other thing that I loved was the front seat was like a sofa from the 1950s, okay? We're very comfortable, okay, there. A little too comfortable, okay? And this is before massage seating, okay? Um, But nevertheless, the cheetah goes 58 miles per hour. Imagine that. The average speed um, over the course of their running is uh, 33 miles per hour. Uh, Now, it goes on to say that their high-speed runs accounted for only a small portion of the total distance that they travel over the course of a day, the research found. They also saw that the cheetah now, now this is what's interesting, the cheetah could slow down by as much as nine miles per hour in a single stride. And it also goes on to say that this helps in their ability to hunt their prey because they're they're so agile, they're able uh, to just break speed right away and then make a turn. And they said that that was more impressive than their you know highway breaking speed ability. Uh, The cheetah often could also decelerate before turning, um, and that also enables them to have an advantage and to be nimble over their prey. And the story just is communicating here that cheetahs are able to make changes very quickly, and that enables them uh, to to really uh, be successful with their prey. Now, let me submit to you today that we need to be, spiritually speaking, like a cheetah. We might be going this way, but when God says change, we got to do it. And when God says go this, we got to be quick. We don't need to pray about things God has already told us to do. You know what that's called? Uh, That's called making an excuse. I'm going to pray about it. No, you don't need to pray about things God has already said a long time ago or things God is confirming uh, through his word and through his spirit. We need to be people who are willing to trade in our stubbornness for the significance that God wants to give us. See, in life, you have to be willing to give things up ultimately to go up, right? It was Dwight D. Eisenhower um, who, in two of his most notable positions of leadership, was a general and president of the United States, of course, once said it this way, there is no victory to be had at a bargain basement price. You know, if we're looking to get out cheap on God, then we're not going to grow to the potential. We're not going to realize the blessings that God has for us. If we're too busy being stubborn, we shouldn't expect for the success that God, that we want for God to give us. It's not going to happen. Whatever it might be, mentally, emotionally, relationally, financially, spiritually, You know, God wants to do a work in my life and in your life, and if I'm too busy being stubborn, guess what? It's not going to happen. And 
He came to be the light of the world. He came to be very clear with this information for you and I to make changes, and we need to be willing to. We got to stop waiting around, stop trying to spiritualize everything, stop trying to philosophize everything. We got to seize the opportunity as it comes, but we have to be preparing for the opportunity. We should be preparing for God to show us things in our life. Maybe it's something to serve Him more. Maybe it's something to give more, to do more, to pray more. God wants to do works in our life, but we got to prepare for the opportunity. You know, the great basketball Hall of Fame coach John Wooden, who was a strong believer, by the way, said it best. If you're preparing for the opportunity once it comes, you're already too late. In other words, you got to prepare in advance before the opportunity comes. Don't wait for the opportunity and then start your preparation for greatness. You start preparing in faith, trusting that God is going to tell you some things, show you some things. He's going to reveal light in your life to help you go forward. And the only thing standing in your way ultimately is your own stubbornness. Um, We got to remove that reluctance and trust God. We got to get out of the boat. Uh, We got to stop deliberating over it and we just got to do it. Here's a conversation I I once heard and I wrote it down. Okay. Um, Dear Optimus, and pessimist and realist. While you were busy arguing about the glass of water being half full or half empty, I drank it. Sincerely, the optimist. Okay? What is that saying to you and I? If there's anybody on the face of the planet that should be optimistic and hopeful, it's you and I because we're children of God. We shouldn't at any time in our life be fearful of what God wants to do. We should be looking, craving his light to shine in our life because we are optimistic, we are hopeful that God is going to do what he's going to do. So we should be preparing for God to show us what's next. We should be preparing for God to open a door. We should be thankful when God reveals something in our life and that, that may not be right, and God says, no, it's got to be this way. We should be like the cheetah and make the change. We don't want to be like the sloth and be slow, okay? We got to be like the cheetah. We want to be the type of person that is seizing the opportunity for change. We want to address any stubbornness in our heart that's saying, I know best, God. I've always done it this way. Well, this is how I feel. Well, this is what everybody else is doing. I'm entitled to this and I'm entitled to that. Now, you could keep living on Excuse Boulevard and go your life that way, uh, but you're never going to realize the true blessings that God has for you. And as Jesus was communicating this, once again, he was saying that it would be foolish for me to hide the very light that I am. I have come into this world that you might know. And so we want to take all of this to heart. In fact, God wants you and I to also know that when we become believers in Christ, he wants to take that stubbornness out so that our heart could be receptive to all that he's going to give to us. Now, this has always been his plan. Look what it says in Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27, speaking about Israel and their restoration. God said this, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart, and give you a tender, responsive heart, and I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and carefully obey my regulations. See, God is at work in my life and your life. He who has begun a good work in us, Philippians 1.6, is faithful to bring it to completion. God is working on me and working on you. We have to get rid of the stubbornness so we can make the changes that God shows us to make. Look at this second principle here. I I filled it in for you already there in your notes. Why don't we say it together? Do a careful self-evaluation to check for self-deception. Now, one of the main stumbling blocks to you and I having light in us and being the light of the world is self-deception, Jesus says. Now, how do we know that? Look at these next two verses here. Jesus first says, your eye is the lamp of the body. Can you say that with me? Your eye is the lamp of the body. So obviously, uh, ultimately, your sight depends on the condition of your eye. So far, so good. That makes sense. 
He goes on to say, when your eye is healthy. Now, circle the word healthy. It's haplos in the Greek language. Can you say that with me? Haplos. And it means to be clear. It means to have vitality. So when your eye is clear, clear, when you have clear vision, when, when there's vitality in your eye, your whole body is also full of light. That makes sense, metaphorically speaking, and that also makes sense spiritually. It goes on to say, but when it is bad, now circle the word bad, panoros in the Greek language, and it means to be cloudy with sin. When your eye is cloudy with sin, your body is also full of darkness. Now verse 35, Take care. Now circle that phrase, take care. It's skepto in the Greek language. Can you say that with me? Skepto or skepio in the Greek language. And what it's referring to is, is pay careful attention. Watch out, be on guard. In other words, take care then that the light in you is not darkness. What is Jesus saying? That you religious leaders, you're rejecting the light that I am, that God has sent because you're trusting in the light that is in you, which actually isn't light, it's darkness. Self-deception. You are deceiving yourself into thinking your religiosity is a replacement for a relationship with me. You know what? If I'm lost and I don't know Christ, obviously that's no good. But you know what? If I'm lost and I think I'm okay with God and my religion is phony, I'm really lost, by the way. I'm really in the weeds. And that is what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that you right now are caught up in being deceived by your own false religion. And so in order for you and I to have light in us, we need to spiritually come before God prayerfully and ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. In fact, one of the most endearing prayers you could pray comes from Psalm 139. Uh, when David said, Lord, search me. See if there's anything in my life that grieves you. You know, when we pray, I think the greatest prayer you could pray is, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, because that covers all of us, by the way. But if there had to be like a, that's prayer one. If there had to be prayer 1A, it's that one. Lord, search me. Lord, show me if there's, if I got a bad attitude. Lord, show me if my mind isn't right. Show me if my actions aren't right, because I don't want to deceive myself into thinking uh, that I'm right all the time. Uh, somebody by the name of Lewis Smedes put it this way. First, we deceive ourselves. And then we convince ourselves that we're not deceiving ourselves, okay? That's what we do. We want to be careful, and we want to take to heart God's Word. We want to take care by looking at God's Word and making sure every decision that we're going to make, is this God's best? Does this line up what God wants me to do? I don't want to live a lie, and neither should you. See, if we're going to live a lie, we're going to claim that, uh, that this isn't sinful, or we're going to claim that this is okay that I'm doing this or that, we could do that but then we're not going to be walking with God the way that he has willed us to do. And so look what it says here in James 1.22. As you find your place there in the notes, the verse is also on the screen. Uh, this is without question a strategy for preventing ourselves from being deceived by our own feelings. Look what it says in James 1.22. Let's say it together aloud. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. In other words, it's not enough just to hear the Bible. It's not enough just to read the Bible. Those are good things. But God's intention is that we would actually put it into practice. When God shines the light, we don't want to be stubborn. As we do this self-evaluation and the Spirit reveals things in our life, uh, we want to make sure that, again, we're not walking in this, this self-denial episode one after another, that we want to be real and honest with God. Because over time, um, the more we lie to ourselves, guess what? Statistics show, psycho psychological research shows that we actually start believing it. I heard the story um, about a man who was allegedly involved in a bus accident while he was riding his bike. The case uh, was being litigated by F. E. Smith, who was a very capable lawyer, a capable British lawyer. He was attorney general from 1915 to 1918. He was known for being very witty in the courtroom. And so he asked uh, the young man who was uh, bringing a, a case against the bus company um, about his injury and his shoulder. And he said, sir, uh, please raise your arm up as far as you can right now. 
And so he did so, you know, grimacing and in agony, he was showing in his face and, oh, and he lifted it up like this far. And the lawyer said, thank you very much. You may put it down. And then Smith said to him, now could you raise your arm up um, to the height it was before the injury? And the man went like this very quickly, very easily. He lost the case, okay? He lost the case, okay? Um, You know, we could get to the point where we make a fool of ourselves when we're lying to ourselves, um, when we're we're deceiving ourselves. And we don't want to do that. We want to ask God to search our hearts. We want to be all we could be. You know, this whole series, all these weeks together talking about salt and light, what good is it if we're not going to understand that the light in us is God? It's God in us. It's Christ in us. And we don't want to hide that. Uh, We don't want to suppress that. We don't want to be in self-denial. We don't want to be deceiving ourselves and making excuses for the things that we shouldn't be doing. And even if right now you and I are having trouble knowing, you know, what's right, what's wrong, again, seek counsel, seek God's word. Again, we want to be the type of people that are humble enough to come before God and say, God, search my heart. One of the most powerful prayers you could pray. Now, I want to just share with you that you will never regret praying that way. You know, when you and I do that, there will be a peace that comes over us. We will experience the confidence, a holy spiritual confidence in our life when we are saying, God, search me. You might be familiar of what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when they have that whole discussion on communion, right? The apostle Paul is saying that if you're going to partake of communion, you got to examine yourself. Now, what was he saying there? That you got to prayerfully come before God, because if you don't, what you're doing is, is you're disrespecting the sacrifice. It's kind of like with our flag. You know, what if we took this flag down and we said, you know what, everybody, everybody could do whatever they want to the flag. Well, uh, somebody might correct me and go, well, people could step all over the flag. People could do this to the flag. Somebody will correct me and go, well, well that's why uh, the men and women, they fought for that privilege to be able to do it. But it doesn't make it right. It disrespects every man and woman that has put on the uniform. And it also shows that we are ungrateful that we live in a free nation. So everybody who wants to disrespect in America, by the way, all the people that think America is terrible in the news, have you, have you noticed they're all multimillionaires? I think I, America's not so bad, is it? But here's the thing, you think it's so bad, maybe move, I don't know. If it's so bad, leave. You know, either, either close your mouth and contribute and help fix what's broken, or go buy a one-way ticket. And so Paul's point in saying you got to examine yourself is because you don't want to trample on the sacrifice that has been made by not examining yourself and partaking of communion or felt, trying to fellowship with God and you have an extra spirit to, to, to search your heart. It's, it's showing a lack of reverence for a holy God. It's not remembering what he has done for us on the cross. And we're deceiving ourselves. And we want to be obedient to the word of God. And so take care, take heed, Jesus is saying, that the light in you is not darkness. Make sure that you're not playing church. You know, some people play church. They think because they might get a title or they hold a tambourine or guitar or clipboard or something like that, that they're spiritual. Guess what? You might be deceiving yourself because it can't be, one, it can't be both ways. Either the light's in you or it's not. You know, Isaiah made it very clear. Uh, you know, woe to those who call good evil and evil good, darkness, light, and light, darkness, right? We're living in those times today. There are people who might claim the things of Christianity, but they're certainly not the light of Christianity because the light is not in them. And it's dangerous when you think that there's light in you when there's really darkness. It only comes from Jesus Christ. And we must realize that, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but through him. You know, I did a funeral for um, a cop this past week. He, uh, for 35 years, he served uh, in the NYPD. And I was asked to do the funeral. He had just retired. And um, he, he had passed away. Um, and the family asked me, and I spoke to, uh, with the widow. And she says, you know, um, uh, you, you don't, you're not going to bring any you know, rosary beads or crucifixes up there or anything like that because we just want Jesus to be preached. I said, that's all I know. That's all I know. 
Um, and not that, not that we're saying that symbols are bad, but we don't want to deceive ourselves into thinking and having any false sense of peace through man-made things. We must realize that there's no other name by which we may be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We don't want to deceive ourselves into thinking, well, we got to be politically correct. I don't know about you, but if I'm lost, I want clear directions on where I need to go. And the clear directions are very clear, aren't they? Uh, we don't want to deceive ourselves into thinking otherwise. Um, we want to make known very clearly, again, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through him. And we don't want to deceive ourselves with any other altar message. Now, as we look at this last point, let's look at this last verse first. As you flip over your notes, look at verse 36 says, If therefore your whole body is full of light with no part of it in darkness, it will be entirely illuminated as when a lamp shines its light on you. What is Jesus saying? That when your whole body is full of light, well, how does that happen? Well, two ways belief in Jesus Christ, and repentance. So notice this last point here. Sincere belief and repentance positions me to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Let's say that together. Sincere belief and repentance positions me to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. You know, when our whole body is full of light, well, what does that mean? That means that I believe. I, I, it's not 50%, it's not 35%. I have my faith in Christ and I've repented. And I've, I, repentance means I agree with God, I'm on the same page, I've turned from my ways and I'm doing it his way. Well, guess what God promises? Your whole body is gonna be full of light. You're gonna be illuminated. It's another way for saying that you're gonna enjoy limitless blessings from God when you're full of light. When you're walking in light, it, you're just full of blessings. Now, I like this terminology, and it reminds me of a restaurant I like to visit when we go away, where they offer, you ready for this? Oh, I, I can't wait to say it. Bottomless milkshakes. Can I get an amen from somebody? <laughs> Hallelujah, wow. Bottomless milkshakes. And they have this tagline in the menu, all you care to enjoy. Oh, I love that. I love that. One time I had seven milkshakes and a waiter, he was slow coming to the table. And I told him, you got to pick it up a little bit here. Okay. I'm ready. Hit me up. Number eight. Let's go. Let's go. Now, the last time we were there, guess what they did? They did something ungodly. <laughs> Terrible. They took it away. So, you know, being the good citizen that I am, doing public service, I asked and I inquired from the restaurant, what, why is this gone? And they used what will now be the new excuse for the next 10 years. COVID, COVID, we took it away for COVID. It's COVID, 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 can't, can't have them COVID, can't have a COVID. No more checks, COVID, just COVID, 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 COVID. Okay, okay already, okay. I'm not sure what that has to do with my bottomless milkshakes. You're still serving milkshakes. I don't know how it's in the bottomless, but okay, if that's what you say. But I love that understanding, all you care to enjoy. And I want to remind you that when you are sincere with God, with your belief and your repentance, it's all you care to enjoy, that God wants to bless us with spiritual blessings. He wants to give you more peace. He wants you to have a greater sense of reality of his mercies that renew every day. He wants you to walk and understand that his grace is sufficient. But when we're too busy being stubborn, when we're deceiving ourselves or all own false version or security of religion or anything else we want to make up, we're not going to live in the reality of God's blessings. We're not going to truly trust in the wind of the Spirit to blow in our lives. But for the believer in Jesus Christ, the one who is repented and on the right road, it's all you care to enjoy. Your Father wants to bless you that way, just as Jesus said, and that is how we are to be the light of the world. You can't give what you don't have. You know, if, if we're walking in darkness, guess what? We're not going to be the light of the world. But we will be the light of the world when we have this conviction. You know, this series, what good is any of this? What are we just filling time every week, coming talking about something from the Bible about salt and light? Why are we doing this? Because we have an assignment. Uh, we have to go share. You know, our last service, one of the ladies came up to me who attends that service 
And she says, you know, I, the other day I was just, God impressed upon my heart. I heard there was an accident on Highland Boulevard. God impressed upon my heart to go to the scene of the accident. She went to the scene of the accident. She bumped into somebody and she was able to share her faith with that person right there. God opened the door up right there. You know, we have to realize that we're on assignment. We don't just come to Christ, get our hell insurance and prop our feet up and wait for it to kick in. God has called you and I to be salt and light. You know, when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, when we started this series all those weeks ago, what was he saying? I'm putting a value on you because salt had a value in those days. The Roman soldier was paid in salt. That's where we get our word, as we told you, salary. It was called the salarium. God puts a value on you and I. You have, a, you, have a very, you, have, you have an incredible value, but it didn't stop there. He said, you're also the light of the world, that you gotta let your light shine that they might see that light and, and they might come to the Father because of it. They might see the good works that you're doing. You know, God has saved us for good works. And life will be very shallow unless we are connected to the things of God and letting that light shine. You know, I've logged many hours counseling, many hours talking with people. And I've talked with people who have a lot. And you would think, well, they got a lot, so they, you know, they, everything's going to go perfect for them. On the contrary. You know, having a lot, you know, what good is if you gain the whole world, the Bible says, but lose your soul. See, sincere belief and repentance is what will position you the way the Father wants you to be positioned. But we got to believe that it's real. Nobody's going to believe in the light in you if you yourself don't believe in it. You know, there's a story that I wanted to, to, to share with you. I actually shared it during when we were locked down. You know, we were all locked down. We couldn't meet. I was coming to give the message. Now, I've repeated many of my illustrations because nobody was watching, so I'm able to keep repeating them during that time. No, I'm just kidding. Two or three of you are watching, I think. But here's one of those uh, stories that really puts self-belief and, and having a conviction into perspective. The story is about a defense attorney who was arguing a case for a client. He was charged with murder. Now, despite the fact that the victim's body was never found, the circumstantial evidence, the story says, was overwhelming. And everyone in the courtroom, including the jurors, and even the security guard, for crying out loud, knew that this guy was dead to rights. He was guilty. The clever lawyer decided to go for broke. As he addressed the jury in his closing argument, the story says, he pointed toward the courtroom doors in the back. He said, ladies and gentlemen, in exactly 60 seconds, the so-called corpse, the man you believe is dead, is going to come walking into this courtroom right through those very doors. And we can begin counting now. Immediately, the eyes of all the jurors went to the door. The time ticked by. One second, two seconds, three seconds, ten seconds, and it kept going. 55, 56, 58, 59. And 60 came, finally, at exactly the one-minute mark. Wouldn't you know it, but who should come striding through the doors? Absolutely no one. Certainly not the victim. The lawyer now faced the jury, and he spoke in a conciliatory manner, reasoning, almost patronizing tone as he spoke. He said, now, ladies and gentlemen, and I quote, I must apologize. I told you something that clearly did not come true. However, you will have to admit that the mere fact that each and every one of you looked toward those doors as you did showed me and showed you, showed the judge and showed everyone else in this courtroom that you had some doubt. And as the judge will instruct you, if there's any doubt in your minds, any doubt at all, you must, you must return a verdict of not guilty and set my client free. The jury went into the jury room to deliberate their decision. They came out in just five minutes. The defense attorney was licking his chops. Five minutes, oh, this is a slam dunk. We got this in a bag. The foreman stood up, faced the defendant, and when he asked the judge what the verdict was, well, judge asked what the verdict was, he said and declared, the defendant is guilty. Well, the defense attorney jumped up and started to scream, how could you? I saw you all watching the doors. Order in the court, the judge said. The foreman glanced at the 
defense attorney in a resolute manner and replied, yes, sir, we did. But we were also watching you and your client. And you did not watch the door. Your client did not watch the door. And because neither of you believed for even a moment that anyone actually was going to walk through those doors, your client is guilty. What's the moral of the story? You got to believe. You got to believe what you're saying. You got to have this belief, not a self belief, but a belief in Christ. You got to have this conviction that He's every bit of the Son of God that the Bible said He is. You have to believe that greater is in, is the greater in you, greater in Christ, greater is Christ in you than He that is in this world. You have to believe without a shadow of a doubt that he indeed who has begun a good work in you is faithful to bring it to completion as we quoted earlier. And you have to believe that no matter what you go through, for you to live as Christ, but to die is gain. No matter what, you are a victor in Christ. And if you're going to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, you want to have a conviction that not even hell could shake. Because you know that no matter what happens in our culture, no matter what happens in our country, no matter what happens around the globe, God is still on the throne and Christ is seated majestically at his right hand and that there's still an empty tomb in Jerusalem. And you with full conviction know that Christ is risen from the dead and you with a full conviction of heart know that the same power that rose Christ from the dead one day will raise you and I. And if those things are true, of course then we could be positioned to be the salt of the earth, to preserve things that are rotting away, and to be the light of the world even in dark places. Again, all this would be a waste. I mean, listen, if not us, then who? We could shake our fist at the world, oh, look at this, look at that. But if we're not going to care for the children that are being trafficked, who's going to do it? If we're not going to care for those with disabilities, we're not going to care for children who are orphans, if we're not going to care for those who are lost, who's going to do it? We're called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And if, and if we don't have a heart, listen, everybody's going to be different for the different things they care about. But when you put it all together, if we're all going to be salt and light together, we can fulfill the assignments that God has given to us, even us, us little Christians, you know, us, our little church, we can be that city, you know, that light on, on a hill that shines for the glory of God in our lifetime. And what better time than now when the world is lost in darkness? What better time than now when they're calling darkness light and light darkness, right? What better time than now? And who better than you and I, children of the Most High God, we're king's kids. We're blood-bought. We have a reservation in heaven, right, that we're going to meet one day. But until then, we're here to be salt and light, every one of us. And there's no greater joy. See, our joy is not in great circumstances, because guess what? They don't exist here. Have you noticed that? Our joy is what? Is the Lord. That's our joy. That's our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength, right? And vice versa. Let us live that way. Let us live with our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, who is the light of the world. And let that light shine through us that other people might know that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your conviction over our stubbornness. Maybe it's our attitude. Maybe it's our availability. Maybe it's what we're doing. Shine the light, God, that we might make changes. We don't want to be a deceived people. We want to walk in fellowship with you. We want to be in agreement with you, O oh God. Help us, O oh God. Help us to be sincere with our belief. Help us to be hopeful in, in the promises that you've given to us. For you've called us to be salt and light. You've called us to be a preservative in this nation, O oh God. You've called us to be light in a dark place. Help us to see this, O oh God. 
and to realize there's no greater significance. For we truly believe there's no other name by which a person could be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. We want to live that truth out lovingly, with kindness, with compassion, with the light that you have put in us. We thank you once more for the cross and the empty tomb. And thank you for the privilege of these assignments to be salt and light. To you be the glory for which you have done, for which you're doing right now, and for what's to come. We sow these prayers now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.